good morning, everybody. I'm going to get started. Uh, welcome to the February 2023 version of ID IIDR Rounds. I'm Lori Burroughs. I'm the Associate Director of the IIDR. Um, this is the first time we've actually had in-person rounds or hybrid rounds, for those of you online, since 2019. So it, I don't, I'm sure you remember when, back when they said, We'll stay home for two weeks while this settles down. Well, here we are three years later. Um, so on that note, we have an extra special version of our rounds today because we have a visitor, uh, Dr. Nathan Char. So welcome, Nathan. You find the podium there. Um, so Dr. Barr is an associate professor in the Division of Infectious Disease at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Uh, I looked at his CV and I saw he did his undergrad in biochemistry. So there you go, students. Yeah. You started off well. <clears throat> his research program, which is funded by the NIH, um, is primarily focused on TB meningitis, cryptococcal meningitis, and histoplasmosis. He's particularly focused on improving diagnostic testing in infectious diseases and collaborates closely with partners around the world, particularly in Uganda to improve outcomes for underserved populations. Um, so I'm excited today because he's going to be talking to us about the difficulties, deficiencies, and breakthroughs for TB meningitis diagnosis. So welcome, Dr. Barr. We're delighted to have you for our rounds. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for the very nice introduction and, and for the invitation, of course, as well. Happy to be here and um, happy to talk about TB meningitis. I'm certain you all gather that I'm pretty enthusiastic about this disease and trying to improve how we care for it. So um, so to start off, let's see, there we go. So to start off, I thought I'd, I'd just talk about why this is an important disease. This is something that certainly in Kansas, we don't see much of. Um, we really don't see much in the US and, and, I, and I imagine Canada probably doesn't see a whole lot of either. Um, but you know, TB, I think we all know it's it's a hugely important problem globally. 10 million or so cases a year um, for the last number of many years has been the WHO estimate. And somewhere between one and 10% of those cases end up with TB meningitis. And so that's a big range, but that conservatively means about 100,000 cases a year. It, there's probably more than that. And part of why there's that big range is there is quite a difference in terms of the likelihood of developing TB meningitis amongst those with TB if you're someone with HIV or without. So, you know, these estimates come from a 1992 paper. So that means that things have changed quite a bit since then, right? We have ART access that has improved quite a bit since then. And so, you know, the likelihood in someone with advanced HIV is very different than somebody who, um, you know, has HIV but is, is well controlled with a high CD4 count. Um, but regardless, this is a this is a disease that kills a lot of people. The mortality rates are 50% in people with HIV, at least, and in a lot of settings, it's much higher than that. Um, even in those without HIV, we're talking about 20%, and stroke and, and neurological disability are incredibly common amongst those who survive. Stroke is a big feature of this disease. And so even for those that do survive, it's really it, it can really be a struggle after that. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this, but one of the major ones is that diagnosis is very difficult. And so uh, what makes it so difficult, one of the big reasons it's so difficult is that in the spinal fluid that we can actually get access to, the lumbar spinal fluid, there just isn't many of the TB bacilli. And so when you're thinking about how to diagnose this, that's sort of a major principle that we have to deal with. It's just hard to find the actual bugs causing the disease. Um, so the other part of why TB meningitis, of course, is why am I interested in this? Why am I pursuing it? And it's not because it's it's a it's a big issue in Kansas, um, but it is a big issue in Uganda. And uh, this is let's see, maybe I should move that there. I don't need to see myself. Um, so it's so it's it's a big issue in Uganda, and and these are my mentors, um, really my main mentors, David Bulwer and David Maya, and they've been working together in Uganda now for 15 plus years, and I've been working with them in our larger team for 10 plus years now. And this started as a, as a collaboration focused on cryptococcal meningitis. And so you can see the uh, what I'm showing there is this lateral flow assay test for cryptococcal meningitis. 
And this is like the dream diagnostic test. It is it's incredibly sensitive and specific, 99 plus percent on both. It takes 10 minutes, it's heat stable. You can make a dream test, this is it. So we don't need help diagnosing cryptococcal meningitis. But what we realized as we you know, got further and further into uh, these trials with, with cryptococcal meningitis is that there were a lot of people that we knew very well didn't have cryptococcal meningitis, um, but they clearly had meningitis of some form. And we knew a good chunk of them had TB. And so um, basically from that point on, that's sort of been a major focus for me is trying to improve that situation where we sort of were left wondering what those folks had. Um, before I go further, I thought I'd just talk about a couple of principles and, and I'm sure there's folks that um, will, will tell me these are way too simplified or understand these quite well already, but just to kind of get on the same page. The first is simply the, the idea of limit of detection for a diagnostic test. And so this has the y-axis here with some sort of concentration, right? And this is, this is made up, so it doesn't have to be real here, but some sort of concentration, colony forming units for mill, something like that. And, and the x-axis is just to divide the data points. And, and on the left, you can see I've, I've made this green line at 100. And so on the left, you see that one dot just above 100, and that would be a positive test in this scenario. And then on the second to the right, you see one just below 100, and that would be negative. And, and, and in general, this is kind of the idea where if you have a cutoff point set, then if you get above your positive, you get below your negative. And so if you can't get enough of the TB bacilli in this case to reach there, you're not going to get a positive result. So that's sort of a principle to keep in mind as you're thinking through some of these tests. The second is this damage response framework. And so this is, we, you know, we've adapted this to TB meningitis and, and I think it works pretty well. And again, organism burden is, is that uh, y-axis and on the x is sort of the immune response. And so you're going on the left from a dysfunctional response, an energetic response to the right where it's strong, appropriate, maybe sometimes way too strong. And, um, and basically what you're seeing as you go up is this clinical disease threshold that we've written in and then these various points of diagnosis. So if you have a test, you know, that we say the limit of detection is 5,000, which AFB smear is, which I'll talk about, then you're not gonna get many of these cases. Now it's, it's more complicated than simply, this is the only factor, but if you have a test that can't detect, uh, you know, anything less than, than this concentration, you're gonna have a hard time finding cases versus if you have a test that's over around the 10 range, you can get a lot more. And obviously the point is to try to get it early on, you know, maybe when clinical disease just develops, you know, if your disease allows you to maybe beforehand, you just want to prevent the neurologic death. And so the neurologic disease or death. And so the earlier you can get it diagnosed, the better. And then the last one, this is, this is a very simple one. Um, CSF is not sputum. And um, I thought I'd spare you all the picture of sputum because I think that's kind of gross. Um, my wife is a, is a respirologist. She would be fine with that. I not. Uh, so, you know, but they're very different fluids, right? It's a clear spinal fluid. You know, there's no mucins in there generally. There's, there can once in a while be blood, but it's not the same as you might have with a big cavity um, in the lung for, for TB. And then that's the other part that's pretty different. I mentioned CSF doesn't have much, generally speaking, but you know, in the lungs, you'll have these big cavities that are just filled with TB bacilli. And so when you're thinking of diagnostics, it's a very different situation in terms of the, the level of, of detection you need to actually get, um, to, to get a positive result. So that's... That's sort of a little background. Now, these are the two tests that traditionally have been available. So one is on the left there, AFB smear. And so this is, um, it's a very simple procedure, right? It's a basic, you do a stain and you put it on the microscope and you look. Um, and uh, how, how that actually gets done can vary, but that's the basic idea. And so this is a systematic review meta-analysis forest plot that we did. And basically just trying to summarize sort of where the, where the data is at with that, because uh, generally our, our result is that it's not great. And, and so this is 8% sensitive, very specific, um, generally very fast, very cheap. So that's all positive, but you're not catching many cases. Um, the other point I'll just draw you to is that Thwaites paper, which is um, one of the outliers there, but that comes from the Vietnam Oxford group. 
and they are wonderful at AFB Smear. They blow everybody else out of the water. They have a tech that's been doing it for 20 years, um, spends a half hour or an hour with every test, uses high volumes, and nobody can replicate them. And I'm saying that not to say they're lying or something like that. They're certainly not, um, but they, they get better results than the rest of us can. And that's in a research setting. Um, if we can't replicate in a research setting clinically, that's not happening, right? The clinical lab is trying to move things through quickly, not spend an hour with a simple test, generally speaking. The other test that traditionally has been available in many places is, is culture. And so AFB smear is pretty ubiquitous, ubiquitously available in a lot of settings because it is cheap. It doesn't require a lot of infrastructure, that sort of thing. Culture requires a lot. And so, you know, you need a BSL-3 safety lab. Um, it's costly. It takes a lot of time. And it is a bit more sensitive, um, you know, 50 to 70 percent some cases, depending on how you're defining things. But um, the big problem really is that turnaround times are slow. So if you have a patient in front of you and you need to diagnose what's going on and you have a, a test that doesn't come back for two to four weeks, you better make a decision long before then or, or your patient's going to be in trouble. And so it, it can be very good for confirming um, a, a disease in a case where you've empirically treated can be helpful in particular for drug, drug susceptibility testing, but there's, there's major limitations there. So that brings us to kind of where things have been moving over the past decade. And so um, the, the biggest change is the availability of, of gene expert. And so um, this is a cartridge-based PCR test. So you can see the instrument and, and an example of the cartridge there. And um, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to do. That's one of the main advantages. It's not a very complicated lab procedure. It's, you know, for, for CSF, it's inject the CSF and press play. So that's pretty good. Um, that's an ideal sort of procedure. Um, and it, I'll go through, there's, you know, there's some positives and negatives with this test, but I do wanna show you some of the papers related to this that were quite important. So the first paper in the upper left is, is uh, this is a South African paper of Renat Patel and colleagues, and this was really the first big published paper on this. I just want to point out two things. One is that the negative predictive values were not wonderful here, right? And so when you're talking about negative predictive value clinically, you're talking about, can I do this test and rule out that disease? So if I do this test and it's negative, am I confident that this is not TB meningitis? And no, is the answer. <laughs> When you're talking about this range, right? You're not. Um, the other thing that's worth pointing out, though, is that the sensitivities they found to be a bit variable depending on how they process samples. So this was sort of a, it was not a pre-planned thing, but it was something that is, as they started doing it, they found that you know they had some samples with larger volumes, and if they centrifuge those larger volumes down, they seem to catch more cases. And so they analyzed that at the end, and. and you can clearly see, you know, there's a difference in the numbers, but it was not done in a sort of systematic way. It was more sort of done as they had things available, and then eventually they change. The other, uh, the other figure here comes from that Vietnam Oxford group, and that was published really shortly after this first paper. And uh, of course, you see the AFB smear is wonderful here, and that's why I went through that earlier. So this wouldn't throw you off too much when I showed you this after just telling you how, how terrible it was. But the main point I want to bring out here is this is a, a group where they have 20 or 25 percent, generally speaking, of their patients um, that they enroll have HIV and, and the rest do not. And you can see there's a clear difference both in terms of how culture works, so the midget culture, the liquid culture, and um, in terms of uh, how expert works. So there's you know a lot higher sensitivity in those people with HIV than those without, and very likely that's related to the fact that um, those, those folks with HIV likely have higher bacterial burdens. So getting back to that sort of damage response framework that I, I talked about. So when those papers came out, we had sort of been planning to look at gene expert ourselves. And, and so we really um, got interested in, in that finding in the Patel paper related to centrifugation. And so that's really what we focused on. So this was back when I was a fellow. Um, and I lived in Uganda for the year. And, uh, and so this was kind of my big focus while I was there was getting our sort of TB diagnostic program off the ground for TB meningitis. And so, as I mentioned, we have a lot of people with cryptococcal meningitis. So, you know, co-infection happens, but it's not all that common. And so we really focused on those without cryptococcal meningitis. And then we, you know, after taking some volume off for basic tests, 
just did two milliliters of, of CSF um, as it as it comes, and then we centrifuged everything else down and uh, used whatever you know used that volume um, really in that centrifuge form to try to do these other testing. So we could pair directly the same exact sample. How did it work out, right? Um, and so this is the basic story, and you can see that the numbers tested were different, obviously. That's because, um, of course, uh, when you do a lumbar puncture, it's variable how much fluid you can actually get. And so, um, you know, when you have that situation, you probably need to make a choice on what test you want to do. Um, but I can tell you these numbers hold up very well when we look only at those that had every every test done. And so the big the big story here is one um, when you look at the sensitivities from CSF that was not centrifuge to, to CSF that was centrifuge big difference that's that's pretty obvious and you're getting right to where culture is as well um, but importantly negative predictive value is still not where you're going to feel confident ruling out this sort of disease you're talking about something with 50 percent mortality so you know even, even if you're talking six seven percent chance that's too high um, so that's that's the basics there so gene expert there this was a big step forward for tb meningitis and uh this, you know, the sensitivities are near that of culture. Um, centrifugation is, is a way to improve that. And, and perhaps most importantly, it's rapid within two hours. That's a, that was a big, big change. Um, it's also great that it's easy to use. So you don't, you know, you don't have to train somebody for a month to be able to run this test or anything like that. This is, I could run the test. So that's, that's how you see this. Um, and, and they're also, by the way, I didn't mention this, but the target is RPOB. It can actually detect rifampin resistance. Um, but I'll, I'll get into that in just a little bit. There are some problems there. Um, so, you know, one big issue for this test is that it's costly. So the equipment I showed you, um, that, that four, uh, that, that instrument with where you could fit in four cartridges, um, last I looked for a concessionary pricing that was about 16,000 us dollars. So that's, that's, a, that's a big ask. Um, and a lot of agencies are trying to help get this in, into places and have been for some time, but that's still, you know, still a, a pretty high cost. Um, the cost of the cartridges is also important. So even at concessionary pricing, this is about $10, um, per cartridge. And so that is a barrier too. And so even if, if you have an instrument that you know, uh, uh, Clinton Health Access Initiative gave to you, um, you still have to get the cartridges on a regular basis. And I mentioned we still can't rule out TBM. You also have to have a steady electrical supply. So in a lot of places, that's a problem. Um, and so that is, that is one sort of big issue here is, yes, it's quick. It's you know under two hours. But if in that two hours, your electricity goes, that's a problem. Um, and with spinal fluid, it's an even bigger problem, right? It's, it's, it's a precious commodity. It's not like it's a, it's a blood draw or a sputum sample where you can try to get them to cough another one out. This is, you know, we have to do another lumbar pump if we want to do that. And people don't love that. Test. Um, and then the last is this, there was, you know, I mentioned we can detect some repapin resistance, but um, this was not perfect. There was, you know, particularly at low um, bacillary loads, which we see a lot with TB meningitis, a lot of false positives, a lot of false negatives. There was definitely issues there. And so um, so are we there yet? Not yet. Um, if we were, this would be a quick talk. I guess that would probably be okay in some ways for you all, I'm sure, but no, not there yet. So there's still work to do, but you know, think of it this way. If we started off up here with AFB smear in most cases at the only test, this is a shift that moves us maybe all the way down here, right? And, um, and maybe even closer if we centrifuge it. So that's, that's, you know, that's an improvement. Now, again, sort of acknowledging this is not quite this simple and I'm simplifying it a bit and there's a lot of things that go into it, but um, that move alone is a big move. So that's, that, that was really a big change. Um, but as I said, you know, not there yet. And so the company that developed this and, and the academic team that, that developed it um, basically set out to try to improve things. And so they made some decisions that were, I think, very good. So one, they they would use the same instrument when they re-engineered this. So that's important because um, a lot of these foundations have done a lot of work to get this instrument out to to uh, to a lot of settings around the world. And if they came with a new instrument, that would be really bad. Um, so they so they didn't do that. They also you know really targeted a similar runtime. In fact, they improved it a little bit, and they kept the cost of the cartridges the same. So they didn't. Um, 
you know, they didn't say, oh, well, this is new. So it's now $50. They kept it at the same price. So that was, that was a good thing. And they did a lot of things to re-engineer this. So they, they increased the size of the DNA amplification chamber. Um, the first the expert had been only based on RPOB. And so they did do some changes with that, um, trying, to, um, trying to improve that rifampin resistance detection. But they also added new targets. So two new multi-copy targets. Um, IS6110 um, being found most of the time, but there are importantly strains that don't have um, IS6110. And so they added the other, particularly with those strains in mind. And there's there's regions of the world where that's very uncommon. There's also reg reg regions of the world where it's, you know, 10, 20% plus don't have that. So that's a big deal. And, 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 and so that's why they made that choice. And so, in, in their lab study, what they found was basically, you know, when they looked for limited detection based on, um, based on the strains they were using, they found that it was getting somewhere near where culture was. Um, and so, you know, if that pans out clinically, then you're moving, you know, you're shifting even further, you're detecting more cases. So that's, you know, that was obviously very exciting when they kind of released their, their data that they had this available and presented it. And so, you know, we had sort of, after that first study, been planning for, you know, we're going to test, we're going to keep working on TB diagnostics. And so we had done a few things. One, um, we saved uh, cryopreserved specimens from our initial study, but then we kept testing people, of course, along the way, and we're saving specimens. And so when Gene Expert Ultra became available, we were able to take those frozen specimens and really quickly um, study this. So that was, that was fortuitous in that way. So you can see the basic flow here, about 130 samples tested and 21 of them were positive by Expert Ultra, ultimately diagnosed as TB meningitis. And then there was another that was negative by Expert Ultra, but was diagnosed by culture as TB meningitis eventually. And so I will show a bunch of Venn diagrams as we go along, because I think they're really helpful um, for looking at comparing diagnostic tests and they, they make it pretty stark what you're seeing. And so what you can see here is there's you know these eight cases diagnosed. It really kind of what I just said, but the, the really important part is Ultra was catching a lot of cases that were not popped by any of the modalities we had before. And so those are patients that either, you know, if the clinicians made the choice to treat empirically, that would have been done, but that certainly doesn't happen all the time. And um, and so they likely would have missed a decent chunk of those. So it was you know an important thing. Um, now I do want to talk a little bit about these research case definitions. So um, that's that's helpful as we go through, and you may have seen some of that in the previous slides. Um, so in 2010, the International TB Meningitis Research Consortium came up with these case definitions, basically to try to standardize diagnostic research so that you know we could at least be looking at the same thing study to study and, and not sort of having to parse out too much um, some, some individual changes studies made. So Definite TBM defined as positive commercial PCR test, positive AFB smear, positive culture, positive histopathology. And then there's probable and then possible. So probable being more likely. And these are based on a scoring system. And I'm not going to show you the whole thing, um, but it's it's you know it's clinical, um, it's, it's history, it's examination, it's CSF findings, it's evidence of TB elsewhere. And if you have access to radiology, that's part of it. If you don't, it doesn't have to be part of it. So they actually have two sort of systems they use depending on whether or not you have imaging access. So that's when I'm talking about all these endpoints, that's, that's a helpful piece to keep in mind. Um, and so what we did when we looked, looked at our data was we basically, we had, we had sort of a little bit of a tricky scenario because we had a new test. It was a PCR-based test. It was going to be commercially available, um, but it wasn't yet. Um, we were also very common that detecting TB DNA in the spinal fluid was very unlikely to be a false positive. And so we didn't want to sort of ignore that and say, well, this doesn't count, but we also recognize that this is a new test. So we sort of presented it in two ways, sort of trying to give all that information, basically. So the first column here is composite endpoint, and that included expert ultra. So we basically took the definition of TB, definite TBM, and said, okay, we're going to include expert as the PCR test here. And so if we do that, you can see the sensitivities, you know, very high with a big difference between expert and, and culture. 
um, as compared to Esper Ultra. And then in the second case, we use the case definitions very strictly. And so we said, okay, definite or probable TBM, Esper Ultra is not counted. This is a new test. We want to you know, make sure we're being as conservative as possible here. And so you can see again, even if we exclude those positive only by Esper Ultra, we're seeing clearly a higher sensitivity with Esper Ultra versus expert in culture. And so what the truth is usually probably means somewhere in between there. And, uh, but, but regardless, it, it's, it's still a pretty impressive result. The other thing we did uh, thinking, well, you know, if you're not totally convinced that we have, um, that we, that, you know, this, this expert ultra test positive is meaningful, let's try to look at another modality as well. And so we had just started collaborating with a team that did next generation sequencing metagenomics. And so, um, we had seven cartridges where we we still had them available and we could send them what we had. Um, and so you can see one of these is listed as negative. That actually was a, a cartridge we sent and there was less than five microliters left. And so they tried it, but they, you know, they said, well, it's negative, but I don't know what that means. Um, and so that was sort of the explanation of that one. But what I think is really neat here is if you look across there's all of these positive by expert ultra, there's four of them positive by culture, and then there's three positive by expert as well. And in all three of those, of course, the next generation sequencing detected the RPO beaching. And so that makes sense, right? That was the only target with expert versus those that detected only by expert ultra or by expert ultra and culture, they detected one of those other targets that they had added. So you can see sort of the decisions that they made when they designed this test and how that practically um, actually influenced what we were able to find in these patients. And so WHO, um, we gave them this data in, in March of 2017, and they really rapidly took this up and made it the, um, the first line test for TB meningitis. And, you know, sometimes um, these recommendations move very slow. I, I gotta say, I'm pretty impressed with WHO with this. They, it was not very long and they put it out. So they're actually pretty nimble on some of these things. So we looked after that and said, well, um, you know, that's great, but it was also frozen samples and we need to replicate this. We also need to do it prospectively. And so that's, that's kind of where we took off from there. And so we did that. And in this case, we have 200 or so tests that we did with Expert Ultra. And, and again, um, 39 positive, nine of those were, were negative by other modalities. And then we also had importantly, a few cases that were positive by other modalities, but not Expert Ultra. I told you I would do Venn diagrams because I think they're nice in this case. So here's the second one. Um, and so this was a very similar story, right? You're having nine cases caught by extra expert ultra, two by only culture, and interestingly, one caught by expert and culture that was not caught by expert ultra. So I, I don't have a great explanation there other than to say, I wonder if something went wrong with that test for expert ultra, but I, I don't actually know what the answer is there. Um, yeah. So this is when we're looking at these sensitivities and they're really presented the exact same way that we did it in the prior paper. So again, if we use that composite standard that included expert ultra, you can see sensitivity in the low 90s versus, you know, they're, they're a bit higher, but the trend is the same as the last paper. And similarly, if we use those uniform case definitions, definite or probable TB meningitis is not including expert ultra, you can see again, um, uh, you know, very similar trends in terms of performance and, and very clear improvements. Um, importantly, also still not a negative predictive value that's going to allow you to say confidently this is not TB meningitis. So this is a, a, a summary that we put together with others in the TB um, meningitis research consortium. And, and, and really, I'm showing you it to point out a couple things, so don't try to digest the whole thing. Maybe that's my bad and I should not show it if I don't want you to digest the whole thing. But um, the main points are, one, um, there is a study from Vietnam that, that had been done and they actually did their study very different. They randomized samples. So one patient would get expert, another would get expert ultra. So done in a very different way as compared to how we did it where every patient got both of them. Um, as I said, they also have a population that generally has less HIV than we do. And so that's kind of the things I want to draw you to. One, there's different methodologies, but two, um, the performance does seem to differ a bit based on how much um, HIV, and, and I would say probably the degree of uh, immune suppression amongst those people with HIV that you have as well. So that's an important caveat to keep in mind. Um, some of these are obviously very small um, uh, and with TB meningitis, that's 
you know, that's not uncommon, but, um, but there is that sort of trend there. So the last bit about expert ultra that I want to mention is simply that um, there, there may be more information we can get other than just the diagnostic information. And so this was a study we published um, 2021, and we looked at, at our patients with probable or definite TB meningitis, um, and we sort of use these categories that, that get produced. So these are these semi-quantitative categories. So they call it trace, very low, low, medium, and high. I've never seen a high in TB meningitis. Um, I'm told they exist. I've never seen it myself. Um, and then, of course, people that had negative expert ultra tests as well. And so when we looked just by these categories, we really didn't see much of a difference in terms of um, survival probability at 14 days. But what we did next is we looked at the cycle thresholds. So if we looked at cycle thresholds, we kind of divided them into tertiles. And so low cycle threshold, meaning a high burden of, of TB bacilli, and, um, and similarly, um, high meaning low. So um, if we looked at this, you can see very clearly the low CT tertile has much worse outcomes. And so that's a bit of prognostic information that you can use with this test as well. So if you do your initial um, your initial um, diagnostics and you get a positive result and you find that there's a very low um, cycle threshold, you should be concerned about that patient and you know their odds of surviving are quite low. So that's a, another important bit of information you can take other than simply they have TB meningitis, they have a case of TB meningitis, they're, they're not at good odds to survive if they have that set up. So the last molecular test kind of um, that I want to discuss, at least for the time being, is, is this TrueNAN test. And this is a newer test developed in India. We haven't studied this yet, um, uh, but we will be shortly in. And this was, there's, there's two really big advantages I want to talk about with this. And one is that it's a battery operated device. So that deal with electricity supply being a problem, this could get around that, right? And the second is it can also be operated up to 40 degrees. And so that's, that's a pretty big deal too. So if you're talking, trying to use this outside of sort of major centers, um, you know, where there's, you know, there's air conditioning and things like that. If you're in a small clinic where the lab setup is minimal, um, and your electricity supply might be sort of variable, it's exciting to have this kind of an option, right? Because you can, you can potentially just use it right there. And, um, and so th this is the only study published on this to date. So we need, you know, we need to look at it, others need to look at it um, and see how it performs in other populations. But you can see the, you know, the sensitivities that they're getting depending on the reference standard they're using are um, very similar to expert ultra. So this is, you know, this is a promising test, um, and there's some definite advantages there, um, but we'll have to see, you know, what comes of this with additional study. Um, okay, so where does this leave us? Well, as I said, you know, if you can get down in this range, that's better. Um, you're catching more cases, but we're still missing cases, and so we're not at the end. Um, and so there's got to be other approaches here, right? Because you're talking getting down to this range, this 10 CFUs per mil, that's, that's really low. And so how much it can be improved on that, that's, um, that's not totally clear, right? I mean, they've, you know, this, this uh, David Allen and this group that came up with Gene Expert, you know, they really obviously worked very hard to improve it every way they can think of all that sort of thing. And, and they're pretty darn good at it. Um, and so, you know, how much further can they go? Um, not clear. So, you know, maybe a combination approach of some sort is needed, right? So maybe you have your molecular test and, you know, we've talked about adding culture and we've talked about, yes, that will catch more cases, but we will not catch them for a couple of weeks. So that's not really great. Um, okay, what about an antigen detection approach? Well, there, there's one antigen with TB that has been of interest and that's this lipo rabinomanin or LAM. Um, and so this is a component of the TB cell wall. And usually what this is used for, so this, this is an approved test that's, that's being used and um, it's usually used testing on urine. So you're looking in people with advanced HIV, looking for evidence of disseminated TB. Um, and it works best at folks with low CD4 count. So the lower the CD4 count, the better the performance. And so I, I decided to change it up and show you somebody else's data. So this is Omar Siddiqui and, and uh, his group in, in Zambia. And, um, I just want to point out basically the sensitivities here right away. So this is, you know, 10 to 20% sensitivity when you use it on CSF. So you're not catching a lot of cases. And I'll tell you, our data is very similar and so are other groups. So when you look at um, 
this allele lamb test, you're not going to catch a lot of cases by itself. But what they did do that was sort of interesting was they, they used some modeling and they combined CSF lamb with expert and glucose and protein, the latter two being pretty widely available, and they were able to get an AUC up to 0.9. And so that was a pretty big improvement. And I think that the, probably the most important piece is just the conceptual piece that adding together expert and lamb was, was a useful sort of proposition. Um, so that's the Allier lamb. And then more recently, there's been this other test um, targeting lamb. And so this is by the Fuji Film Company. And um, they added some, um, they, they targeted some novel lamb epitopes. They added a silver amplification test, but it's still, you know, a, a fairly uh, easily done test that doesn't require a lot of equipment or anything like that. And there is data, you know, looking head to head versus a lear lamb in urine, and it's clearly performing much better there. But this is prototype for sure, and um, and so it really, this is the only study so far that that we did back in 2021 where where it was looking at this test for TB meningitis, and so. You know, it is a visual read, and so we had two independent readers. We had a third person to break the ties and all that sort of thing. And mostly, this was frozen samples. Um, but then, you know, there were a few fresh, and, and with those, we didn't use it for care because we really didn't know how accurate it would be. And so, this is the same basic setup here, right? So, over here, positive tests by Fuji Lamb, and you can see most of those were definite TBM. But the interesting thing is, there was six of those positive by this Fuji Lamb that were not positive by expert ultra culture, et cetera. And then you get to the question of, okay, well, what does that mean? Because this isn't, you know, this is an antigen, this is not DNA that we're finding in the spinal fluid. So how confident are we? And so we have five of these probable cases. Um, so that, you know, by the scoring system, five of those six were probable. And so there's a decent likelihood those are truly TB meningitis. But we also had one that was a non-TB mycobacteria that was uh, what caused that positive Fuji lamb test. So that's really important. And that's our worry with an antigen in particular with this population is a non-TB mycobacteria, mycobacteria avian complex, something like that. So that's important. And then the other just part is to say there were a number of definite and probable cases um, that were not caught by this. So to show you it, just when we look at the definite TBM Definition, you can see expert ultra, there were many cases positive there that were negative by Fuji lamb, but there was one culture positive case that was negative by expert ultra. And then when we look at definite or probable, you can see there's a bigger mix sort of reflecting that issue that I just spoke about. So when you look at this sensitivity numbers, where does that put you? Well, with expert ultra, if you're looking just at definite TBM, there isn't much improvement to be had, right? But if you sort of acknowledge, yeah, but we know we're missing cases. And so you include that probable range, the performance is somewhat similar just at its baseline, but then if you add them, there, there may be something to that, right? So it may be that we can catch more cases if we combine them. But practically, what does that mean? Well, this Fuji lamb test needs more study, I guess is the first thing to say, but it could be a helpful test to add to expert ultra. It could also be a test that's useful where expert ultra isn't accessible. So if you, you know, there isn't a lot of laboratory capacity, but you know, you can still do this test without that. And then the big question is, are these are these real? You know, are these cases that were only positive by Fuji Lamb real, or are they false positives? So we need a bigger study to look at this, and we need to really robustly investigate these alternative diagnoses. Um, and so, are we there yet? Um, and by the way, I found this, of course, on a just a Google image search, but it was from a parenting resilience website. And I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and an eleven-month-old, so I that hit home. I like that. Um, <laughs> So there's there's more to come on this though. So thanks to NAID, we, we do have funding and, and we'll be looking at that and they're going to be ready to get us tests. They've told us in quarter two of, of this year. So hopefully soon we'll be able to start testing this, but we are, we're freezing samples and then we're going to plan to look at it in real time. Okay, so what other approaches, right? So that's one potential combination approach. Um, what about just, you know, info that we can get easily, clinical information, basic lab testing. So this this has been looked at pretty thoroughly. It's not published yet. Hopefully it will be quite soon. Um, but this is a, a systematic review that, that we contributed data to. We certainly didn't lead, but um, it was big. You know, 3,600 patients did a lot of different modeling approaches. 
ultimately came up with this, you know, looked at all these different factors. You can see um, the focus here was to look at basic CSF findings, um, cryptococcal antigen, because it's more widely available, and then just basic history types of stuff, and to see can this information be used without these specific tests. Um, so centers that don't have access to much in terms of specific tests, can they use this to sort of shift their probability um, the way they think about TB meningitis? That was the focus of, of this study. And so, you know, when they use just the basic CSF testing, HIV status, presence of fever and cryptococcal antigen, you can see their internal validation gave them this um, range of C, C statistics based on um, the modeling approach. But then when they did an external validation, um, they used Ugandan um, samples that, you know, from our, our group, but those that hadn't been published yet. And so, you know, they could use it as sort of an external validation. Um, and they were able to get you know, pretty decent AUC. I think the questions here are, how does this actually work out clinically, right? So this was totally a modeling uh, thing with diagnosis, but how does this work out clinically? They're hoping to develop an app. They're, they're planning to develop an app and sort of use it that way. And then, um, and then you know, just keep in mind this external validation was from a population that not the same patients, but it was, you know, folks that were, that were you know, there's a number of studies from that same population included in the initial model. And then, you know, there's pluses and minuses of not including those, um, those more specific tests, the expert ultra, all that sort of thing. You know, it's, it, if, if the end goal is to be able to do it without it, obviously you need to do that, but it does limit you. You may be missing things simply because that's not available. Um, so that's another potential approach. Um, I mentioned that the TB meningitis definitions take into account whether you have TB elsewhere. And so that's another sort of approach to this is to say, okay, well, if you have meningitis and you also have a big cavity in your lung, maybe there's a good chance of that, right? So we decided to try to use some of these other tests to see if we could augment what was going on. So or I shouldn't say the other tests, other fluids. Um, so we used urine testing of Expert Ultra in the Lear lamb on people with suspected meningitis. And there's a couple of things that are really interesting here. So one, our patients with crypto meningitis had a lot of TB. So you can see that was very frequently po positive, either Expert Ultra or LAM. And then of course there was positives amongst our folks with TB meningitis that we knew about, but there was also a fair bit of positive results amongst those people that were probable. And so that's pretty important, right? Because probable again means they did not have a CSF test that told us they had TB meningitis. But if we look at the urine, we can find TB in a lot of those patients. So that's a pretty important finding for us too. Um, and this is just showing, you know, in those urine tests and people that had both of these tests done, the Allier lamb and the Expert Ultra, which were positive by which modality. And, and the main point here is just simply to say, if you only checked one of them, you were going to miss a pretty large, large amount. So that's, that's sort of an important finding too. All right. Uh, so moving on. So I'm coming up with all kinds of different ideas, right? Um, maybe you can all give me some more. That'd be great. Um, what about sort of different ways of doing this molecularly? So we have this expert ultra, um, we have this true net that's promising. There is, I will mention, I'm not gonna talk about it much, but there is um, some interest in CRISPR. There has been a small study using that to sort of augment, um, augment a molecular approach. Um, and so we'll see what comes out of that. There's some interest. There is a really pretty robust study with um, pulmonary TB using other samples, and we'll see if we can get a hold of that at some point. But this is a metagenomics approach. So we have partners in at UCSF that use um, metagenomic next-gen sequencing. And so, you know, we basically the same sort of idea, right? We send send them a bunch of samples. Of course, these are frozen and sent them after the fact. But there's some important things here to point out. So one is there was a lot of definite TB cases, TB meningitis cases that we had confirmed with other modalities that were negative in this modality. Um, there was also a number of probable cases that were negative here, but this is where this technology is pretty neat, right? Because we were able to say, oh, actually, um, you know, a number of those probable cases had di a different pathogen. Um, so that's pretty important, right? So, you know, knowing that these probable cases, we think they're probably team meningitis, but we're knowing there's uncertainty there because we haven't found it. And so this is able to tell us, well, there is some other pathogens there. And then lastly to say, even with all these other modalities, we were still, there were still some cases that were positive with this metagenomic approach that were negative with other approaches. So there's, 
you know, there's a there's a lot here, and there's there's sort of holes everywhere you're looking at this, and that's why this sort of um, combining approaches is attractive. Um, this this figure on the right is, is simply showing in those with the less likely TB meningitis cases, so possible or indeterminate. Some of those had TB, but some of those had toxoplasmosis, uh, you know, CNS toxo. Some had cryptococcus actually, and some there were a number of viruses we found, including some that do seem to be pathogenic, but that we had never heard of. Um, so there, there is a bunch of that there. And then the last bit that's really important here is that this is really costly currently, right? So, um, so our team estimated $75 a sample, and that's not including the instrument, not including service contracts. Um, you know, there's people you know probably better than me, a lot of informatics work involved here. And so that, that's a big thing. And uh, and I, I know Dr. Wilson and, and the others are really concerned about that when they're talking about trying to apply it and they're actively working on some solutions there, but that is a that is a big barrier. And then the second part of what they did was um, they also did um, RNA sequencing and they made this machine learning um, classifier based on host gene expression. And so this was a smaller sample that did that, but when you looked at um, this classifier, they took in 15, 15 different components and, um, and tried to see if it could correctly classify things. Now, this was only definite TB meningitis, so that's a limitation there, but you can see they were able to classify most of them amongst this pretty small sample. Adding the metagenomics improved it a bit, um, but I think this is an area that it's appealing, but it clearly needs, needs more data, more population, all that sort of thing to make sure um, this can be done, but that's it's certainly of interest. And then that gets to the last approach, which is which is looking at post factors. So that I talked a little bit about it there. I'll just mention briefly. This is this is a table. I should have probably found a different table. This this one paints too rosy of a picture when you look at these numbers. Um, but adenosine deaminase, you know, it's made by lymphocytes. It's used in um, pleural fluid to try to diagnose TB. Um, that's been looked at extensively. It hasn't hasn't worked out very well for a number of reasons, um, some of them listed there. Um, interferon gamma release assays, you know, done pretty frequently for latent TB. Um, we know there's a lot of false positives with active pulmonary tuberculosis with inter interferon gamma release assays. There's also been a lot of interest in applying these to spinal fluid. Um, and, and there's a number of issues there, but one of the biggest ones is um, depending on the design, they can be pretty reliant. Well, they are pretty reliant on T cell function, depending on, depending on how you design it. And um, there's a lot of indeterminate results, particularly with CSF when this has been done. And so that's a big problem too. So that sets aside costs and infrastructure needs and all that. And then there, there are a number of antibodies that have been looked at over the years. I, I put up a few of them here, but these are these are not used commercially and, and um, <coughs> They're not as rosy as this. Some look. This makes them look actually pretty darn good. Um, we've tried some other markers. You know, we 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 had a, a veterinary colleague that was looking at these markers for um, bovine tuberculosis, and he's tried to see if these would apply. And you can see, you know, on sort of first glance, the numbers are higher in TB meningitis, so that was sort of appealing. But when we looked, you know, and actually diagnostic accuracy measures, they were either quite insensitive or um, not terribly specific, so not ideal. And so there's a lot of ongoing work here. So one of these is um, Sapit has made this host response panel. And so it includes these three gene um, markers for mRNA expression. Uh, I've, I've underlined this GBP5 because that was actually part of the classifier that, that we had done with UCSF, although not one of the, the four um, most important ones. Um, uh, but this is this is a prototype that's being tested now. They've published some interim results for pulmonary TB um, done done at those four sites there, um, three sub-Saharan African sites and one in Vietnam. And so they're hoping they can get it to be 90% sensitive, 90% specific. That's sort of the WHO definition of a triage test for TB. Um, and so we'll see if they get there. But this is a test we're looking at now as well for TB meningitis. And then for the last four-ish years, we've been collecting additional samples for RNA sequencing, as well as looking at these big multiplex panel, panels with key, a number of chemokines and cytokines. And so we're interested to see whether any of them can be leveraged for a diagnostic role as well. And, and so just to emphasize, you know, 
we're not trying to diagnose in those cases all TB meningitis. We're hoping perhaps that, you know, in those people we know don't have cryptococcal meningitis and those people that we can't confirm in another way, maybe this is something that can be combined and reliably discriminate that group that probably does have TB meningitis, but we can't find it in any other way. And so, you know, interferon gamma is one example. I mean, if you just look at the numbers, there's more in TB meningitis than comparators, but it's not non specific, you know, in, in that there are other diseases that will cause it to spike. And so, again, the hope is to sort of narrow it down to that group with other information in mind. So, there's a lot of approaches um, that, that may be promising. I hope I've given you a quick snapshot of, of what that might look like. Um, but, you know, the idea would be, again, if you kind of put it through this simple framework, maybe we're over somewhere in here right now, but if we can find some perhaps immunologic signature, that's with these folks that have a really strong immune response, maybe we can get the rest of the way. But there's a lot of, of, of uh, potential components to look at here. So, uh, you know, I kind of think of this sort of where are we at, where are the needs, um, and, and I sort of think of it in terms of where, what are themes and then what are specific tests um, that really need to be looked at soon. So a couple of the tests that are really important to look at and, and that are being looked at are Fujilam and, and the TrueNet test, and those are being looked at. You know, cytokine, chemokine approach, other host response panel, panels or signature, those all need to be investigated. And then whether or not CRISPR can be utilized to improve molecular capabilities is, is definitely of interest too. Um, themes, I didn't talk any about pediatrics. I probably should have mentioned that at the start. I'm an adult doctor, so I, I have nothing to do with taking care of kids, but we do need pediatric specific studies for these, right? The immune response is different. The disease is different. It's really a big, important disease in neonates. And, um, and so there has to be pediatric studies. And there is a group now looking at a number of these tests in a big pediatric TB meningitis trial. So that'll be excellent. There also really has to be a focus on figuring out ways to translate some of this um, costly technology to, to things that are both affordable and durable. Um, in a lot of settings, because that is certainly a limitation at this point. And, and part of making sure that happens is just doing more cost effectiveness studies and, uh, and implementation studies. And, and I'm, I'm happy we're, we'll be doing some of that going forward as well. And then I talked a lot about combination approaches. I don't need to talk about that more. Um, so this is some of our team, definitely not all of our team. Um, and so I just want to call out a few people to thank because um, they're so important for this work. Um, so David Bulwer and David Maya are, are, are uh, my mentors and, and, and very important to this, this work. Um, Radha Rajazihan is, uh, is uh, really a leader with advanced HIV in a lot of ways, but amongst her expertise is, is cost effectiveness work. And then we have a big biostats team led, led by Kathy Hepler Halsek, who um, are crucial very crucial for me. Um, Fiona Cresswell is, is at IDI and she leads our, our clinical trials for TB meningitis. And then we have a big team of medical officers, nurses, and a, and a big lab team that um, that is is obviously incredibly important too. Michael Wilson and, and Prashant Ramachandran in UCSF do the metagenomics and then of, of course our funders as well. So that's all I have. I'd be happy to take questions. And move aside. Awesome. I have tons of questions, but I'm going to ask the, let the audience ask questions first. So, uh, first we'll go to the room. I see we have one question online. Uh, any questions from the room? Yeah. Back. Done. <laughs> no problem. You guys don't have to fight over me. It's fine. Um, I, I'm, this is a bit of an A question, but how specific is it against? Um, avian and even environmental mycobacteria species, and how much how problematic is that in the real world for testing? Which test are you? Well, I was thinking you're expert. Yeah. So, so for that, it's pretty good. So we don't really run into problems there, and they've designed it that way where the targets are, are going to be less problematic. But particularly with you know antigen testing, things like that, where there's potential for cross reactivity that you're not planning on, it's a worry, and it would be a worry for. You know, potentially some of these host targets too. Um, so yeah, so but with expert ultra, it's, it's not such a such a bad problem. All right, I'm going to get you to move this way oh, so that you're actually visible to the audience. <laughs> yep. Okay, Dirk. Uh, 
Um, you mentioned for your NGS assay, I was just wondering what sequencing platform are you using for that? And you know how many reads off the top of your head that you're typically getting to make a robust diagnosis? Oh, so I know kind of. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so it's an Illumina. Uh, what exact platform? I pass that. Idea. Illumina is good enough. But okay. Good. Not good either. Okay, that's good. <laughs> and how many reads? So I mean, so it can vary a bit, but there they are. Um, there's some that are incredible. You know, um, I want to say millions. Does that make sense to you? I yeah. mean, that's very high number. Yeah. And but there are some that are much less, and so um, that is part of the, part of the problem with this disease in general is, is sometimes it's much less. So yeah, there are cases where they're sort of trying to discriminate, like okay, at these lower reads, what does this actually mean? Yeah, and that sort of thing. And um, is there a benefit you think, um, and an argument you made made of an argument on top of the argument you already made for NGS as a diagnostic platform in terms of the ability to monitor infectious diseases and sort of mm -hmm. track their dispersion based on SNPs and other signatures you can see in those assays relative to others. So you're saying monitoring for treatment effects, essentially, yeah? Monitoring for treatment, but also for just the dispersal of, like, looking at the dynamics of how a disease will move through a population, mm -hmm. how it moves from one spot to another. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there certainly could be. Um, yeah, in terms of the populations, uh, I don't, yeah, that could be of interest. Certainly, we haven't done anything with that at all, and so I'm not sure if I can can say with any evidence, but it, that's interesting. Um, in terms of you know a treatment response, I mean, that's possible too. Maybe that's less what you're interested in, but that could be possible. But it would be something with you know a meningitis, you would need multiple samples to look at. Um, so with crypto meningitis, which we also work on. That's something um, where we do do a lot of lumbar punctures, and so we do have that sort of information. And um, there is some data on um, some PCR techniques that that, that may be useful. Um, with TB meningitis, it's tricky because they often don't need multiple lumbar punctures. So with cryptococcal meningitis, they have these really high intracranial pressures, and so part of the treatment is to get rid of more spinal fluid. And so that's not the case with TB meningitis, and so. You know, then you're talking about oh, can you, know, you got to sort of, you got to sort of feel like there's a true potential of benefit there before you're one going to study, but certainly before you're you're going to do it routinely. So I guess we would need to reason out the study before we could <laughs> we could tell the patient, yeah, this is good for you. You got to do it. <laughs> Great, thank you. I have other questions, but I'll save them for the end because I don't want to monopolize. Other questions? Uh, did we have a question online, Blake, or is that just you in the chat? Uh, down at the uh, yep, there we go. All right. Uh, so how do you respond to trace calls and expert ultra results in patients from high TB burden and also low TB countries? Yeah, so this is an area that is very different with TB meningitis than it is with pulmonary TB. So this is pulmonary TB, kind of a, a controversial sort of a thing, right, because um, they're this has been sort of a problem when they rolled out expert ultra for pulmonary TB. There are patients that have had pulmonary TB in the past. It's a high burden area. Um, and so they detected it sort of this small amount and they don't really know, is this actually a problem? <clears throat> With TB meningitis, you shouldn't be finding TB DNA in the spinal fluid. So in those cases, we, we respond as if it's a true result. And we know that the, um, the likelihood of um, getting a trace result is actually, that's that's a pretty common result for us because there is so few TB bacilli there. So it's it's a different context because of the disease site, but it's also a different context um, basically because of um, of the way the disease works <clears throat> rather than um, the pulmonary TB where, you know, it, it, trace is more rare, right? You expect to see more of TB um, called in pulmonary TB. Can I add, ask sort of a follow-up question to that? Because this is one of the, the curiosity questions for me. Yeah. You're, you're, you're testing these patients because they have symptoms of meningitis, I'm assuming, right? So it, it surprised me that it's, you have such a hard time finding bacteria yeah. if, they have, if they're symptomatic. I would yeah. have expected that it's higher. So how do you reconcile that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a few things. One, one thing that um, actually a neurosurgeon that's that's involved in TB meningitis work in, in Cape Town has sort of taught us um, 
he's hammered it into us whether we've listened or not is that that's the csf is not the same throughout the the, the cns so he has kids that require extra ventricular drains and so he has access to ventricular spinal fluid and so when he looks there it's a very different piece than it is when we look with a lumbar puncture obviously we're not going to look most of the time with, with ventricular csf um so that's part of it. It's, it's incredibly different in terms of the inflammatory markers and things like that, markers of um, CNS damage, things like that. Um, now, whether it's truly different in terms of bacterial burden is less clear. He hasn't done that work and we're not in a spot where we can do that. But that's that would be one idea. I, I will say the other thing he's, he's done sometimes is shown us these uh, basically endoscopy views where he'll go in through the drain and just show us with the camera what it looks like. And it's, it's, it is not what you would imagine a brain to look like. I mean, it is, you know, there's webbing, there's all kinds of gunk clogging everything up. And so it's hard to imagine amongst that there are more bacilli than what we see down in this really clear, nice sample of spinal fluid that we get from the lumbar area, but that hasn't been proven. So it's, you know, that's, that's sort of, that's what I imagine is probably happening, but I, I think that we don't know that because I need to talk to him and beg him to do that so I can he can try to prove it. <laughs> okay, uh, last question from JP. Hey, how are you? Well, well, we met in Uganda a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, really nice talk. Thank you. So what's the frequency of co-infection by cryptococcus and yeah. TB? I noticed that most of the time you sprinkle cryptococcus first and yep. then you ignore that population. Yeah. And if you if they have co-infection, uh, what's the, are the symptoms very really different? Is it synergistic? Yeah, it's a part of the infection. So we used to think it was like it never happened. And that's not true. Um, so as with as with almost everything with advanced HIV, right, you can have multiple things going on at once. So it happens. It's it's about one to two percent of of our population that ends up with that. And so, um, you know, we don't test uniformly with all these tests for TB meningitis in our crypto population. But generally, what we're doing is if we're not seeing an initial response. Um, that, you know, sort of, you know, you get the initial LP done, you get the treatment started and, and they're not improving, then we have sort of a low threshold to send off TB diagnostics. And in that case, you know, we're doing a lot of lumbar punctures as I mentioned with cotyledonal meningitis. So um, it's not a problem to get the fluid. And so we have sort of a very low threshold how to do that. And usually we're talking you know, day three, um, day five, that sort of thing. And so we're hoping to see some response. And if it's not happening, that's one of the possibilities. Obviously, some people just are gonna do terrible no matter what we do. It's not because they have a second infection, but we sort of look at that population kind of well and say, this is this is a uh, you know big enough risk that we want to test for it. But we still think it's not something we need to do in every patient. Okay, uh, I'm gonna stop there for sake of time, but please join me in thanking Dr. Barr for a fantastic talk.